This is Live from the Table, the official podcast of New York's world famous comedy seller coming at you on Sirius XM 99, Raw Dog. And on the Laugh Button Podcast Network, this is Dan Natterman calling. I mean, I'm not calling. I've got brain fog. That's <laughs> apparently one of the symptoms of the Omicron virus, which I have, according to a Binax, a home test that I took the other day. But I was, uh, I've, been, I've been feeling ill since... Um, since in the middle of the night Sunday. Anyway, I'm here with Noam Dorman and Periel Ashenbrand, and we are doing this all over Zoom because Nicole, our sound person, uh, her boyfriend has COVID, and I have COVID, and the comedy seller has a lot of cases of COVID. Should I say that, Noam, or is that not a good thing to say? Um, so anyway, we're, we're, we're avoiding the place. And you say what? I didn't hear what you said. I said the comedy said there's, there's quite a few uh, comedians that have come down with the vid, apparently. Yeah, yeah, don't say that. I won't say that. Well, it's good <laughs> I already said it. But, um, but we forge on, and it's all systems are go, Noam, or what's the, what's the situation? There's no yeah, all says it was a go. I mean, the mayor, the mayor doesn't seem to think we should do anything. So why should we do anything? I mean, pe- so, um, I mean, we, I know. I mean, everybody, everybody in America must already know a lot of people who have this, and they all seem to be mild. Um, you know. Well, look, as long as everybody's aware of the situation, you can come uh, swim at your own risk, as we like to say at the Comedy Cellar. And I mean, I, business, I, business is down a bit. 15 to 20 percent i would say but uh, it's not down um the way you would think it would be down i mean i wouldn't i'm not looking for but i'm older you know i'm not looking forward to go out um i mean i'll still go to strip clubs but i'm not going to a comedy club. um as i understand it Noam, the rules have slightly changed there's no more drink minimum or is that just for new year's that's what i heard uh well for new year's although new year's we we actually never really used to enforce a drink minimum but um, we never had, we've never had a drink minimum. We've always had a two item minimum, but um, the people don't want to take their masks off. I think all along we've not been enforcing that if the reason they don't want to make the minimum is because they don't want to take their masks off. Uh, well, my, you mentioned everybody seems to be mild. Yeah, I've been mild. Um, I was, you know, I was literally on my way to Aruba. I was, I was escaping the, the hot zone and I was like, this close to getting the hell out of town and then all of a sudden I wake up with a scratchy throat with with light congestion and then I go on Google and at first I thought well it's just a cold but given the times I went on Google I expected Google to say don't worry about it if you got if you if you and I was sneezing I said I expected Google to say well sneezing that means you got a cold don't worry about it but Google didn't say that Google said as a matter of fact uh sneezing is one of the symptoms of this Omicron thing <laughs> I go out side and I try to find a home test kit to verify that I don't have COVID so I can go to Aruba and they're all sold out of home kits. So I'm like, ah, what do I do? Do I take a chance? So I, I elected to, uh, to, to not go. Um, and then a few, couple days later, I finally got my hands on a home test because I didn't feel like waiting online for an hour at City MD With a bunch of people with COVID. Uh, yes. I, I could have given you a test. I, we, I have a bunch of them. Well, what would you do? Mailed it to me? I would have dropped it off downtown for you. Okay. Just because uh, you can't imagine yourself doing these kind of things for friends doesn't mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found one here. at Eisler Chemist on the upper on Lexington Avenue. They're probably sold out by now. Uh, but to any in any case, um, it has been a mild affair, and uh, thank. Hopefully, it'll stay that way. And then he sent me a picture of it, and he said, "Does this look positive to you?" Yeah, because it was a very on the Binax test. If you have two pink lines, it's positive. But my my bottom pink line was very faint, and um, so I asked for a second opinion. And she said, "You're ugly too." <laughs> <laughs> That's an old bit, of course. So but, uh, I, I had it. Go ahead. I don't want, uh, this. So you you, you took. Yeah, so she said, "No, even if it's faint, uh, that means it's and and it makes sense. What else would it be? I I had a cold a month ago, so it's like who, probably not another cold and. In any case, and I've been hanging out around COVID people. So I want to tell you the story, my story. And 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 the, 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 I'm going to tell you the end of the story is what you should conclude from this story is that people like um, uh, George Soros and wh- whoever these people are that made millions and billions of dollars on the stock market, 
um, don't think that they're so smart because there's a tremendous amount of luck that goes into it. So uh, back in August, I took the third Moderna shot and I took a full dose. I didn't take a, I didn't take a booster. I took a full dose, a full hundred mil, micrograms, milligrams, whatever it is. And um, so then it came out like two weeks ago that Moderna says that the fourth, but the third dose of Moderna helps you, but the, but not the booster dose. The booster dose helps a bit, but the full dose, that is the one you should take a hundred, even though that's not the one the FDA approved, the full hundred dose increases your antibodies by 87 times. And then I took a fourth dose of Moderna four months, based on my four months after my booster. I took it uh, two weeks ago. I mean, uh, uh, five days ago. And um, came out today or yesterday that Israel has now authorized a fourth dose of the booster four months from the time you've taken your third dose, precisely at the time. So I've, fall, I've fallen on my feet in every decision that, that I've made here. But, and, and there's a certain amount of intelligence that went into it, but there's a tremendous amount of luck. And if this, if this was you know, shorting the market or stocks or whatever it is, I'd be a multi-billionaire now. It does, it's, it's just, you know, you, you, even, even the decision to take Moderna was half luck or, or all luck. So, but, uh, I, so that Sunday night, Sunday after I got the fourth dose, I, I was meeting some friends and I wanted to cancel my dinner, but I said, I haven't, haven't seen this one guy particularly in a while. I really like him. So I texted him and my other friend. I said, listen, uh, I'm going to, I'll, I'll meet for dinner, but I have to, we have to eat in the shed outside the olive tree. I, I is too many. I don't want to eat indoors. And they started calling me out of, out of date words that mean that you're kind of effeminate. I can't, I can't say the word anymore because that word is not supposed to be used anymore, but, uh, but among 60 year old guys, it is still sometimes used in the schoolyard sense. And I said, look, that's the way I feel about it. Wouldn't you know that one of the guys I sat with tested positive for COVID. This was Saturday night. I'm sorry. One of the guys I, I, I t- tested positive for COVID that Sunday morning. And my wife put me immediately into isolation, but you know, it's four days later now and I don't have it. I tested negative and I think a big part of it had to do well, it's either was the, it was either getting the booster or being outdoors or both. But um, so I had, I, I had, they had to all apologize to me for calling me that word because I actually prevented like four other people from getting COVID because I insisted on eating outdoors. Well, the question is, 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 are you just putting off the inevitable anyway? And well, it- th- that, that's one way to look at it, but the, the inevitable, I mean, like if, if you could have put off getting uh, bubonic plague by a thousand years, your chances of, rec- <laughs> your chances of surviving it are way, way better even if it was inevitable. And my, my point being that the more you put it off, the better the medicines are, the technology, the, you know, so like already we have pills and Regeneron and, and, and they know which way to lie in the hospital. So, so your chances of surviving it and not are, are much, much better the longer you put it off. But yes, yeah, but eventually I, I we'll get it. Now, now is a good, as good a time. Well, I guess it could be, could get even better, but. <clears throat> now is not a bad time. It, you, now is not a bad time to get the Omicron. No, especially Omicron does seem to be less uh, serious, at least for people who are vaccinated. It's clearly, I mean, there's data today out of South Africa that said that uh, it's like one tenth or one ninth of the people uh, with, are hospitalized Omicron versus Delta. Uh, but the, I mean, the bad news for me is the timing, because like I said, I was I was a hair's breadth of escaping the hot zone. And I would yeah, have been- to be fair, Dan, we told you to take Moderna. I don't know that that would have made the difference. I don't know, but uh, the, but based on the, the data. No, it, what I should have done is been more careful at the comedy selling because oh. I was hanging around, hanging around everybody. <clears throat> I figured I was invincible. And then Marina tells me, you know, there's a fucking, it's going around here. And, but by then it was probably too late. It was not going around the comedy cellar. It was going around everywhere. There's, there's, I mean, the comedy cellar is part of everywhere. There's, is there's, there's 20,000 or 19,000 cases reported yesterday in New York City alone. This is more than at the peak of the pandemic. It's it's, it's everywhere. Do you I'm, think that we're all going to get it eventually? Or do you think that this is going to like pass? We're in a surge no. right now and it's crazy and it's going to pass. All, all is a big word. 
many, 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 many people are going to get it. And then it's going to fade away and some people won't. And, you know, if, if you're, if, if you're extremely careful, the thing about risk is that, it, you know, it adds up. So if you, if you're careful where you go inside, if you wear your mask all the time, if you take the, 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 the vaccine that has the highest likelihood of protecting you, all these things compound you, you, you may not get it. But the, the other, the flip side is that I, I don't think you should really worry that much about getting it at this point, because we've all known dozens of people already have been through this Omicron thing and they're fine. And it's, it seems that even though like I had COVID, that doesn't seem to. That's give not going to help you. Right. No, that, that will not help you. And what about going inside with a mat with a, you know, and KN95 mask on? Well, I think you should get rid of the KN95 and get a, get a, an adult real N95 or an N100 like I got. <clears throat> okay. But I don't have that right now. So is it. I can, I can give you one. Thank you. That's very nice of you. But in general, I mean, sell you one. Did I say give you one? I can sell you one. <laughs> <laughs> um, by the way, I've seen the, you know, the COVID at home test people are selling for double what they were. They're sold out everywhere. It's crazy. But can I wear my KN95 inside and be okay? I don't know. I mean, the thing about KN95s, you're definitely better than not wearing it. You're probably okay. I mean, a lot, a lot of our staff has just been wearing those K95s and have not gotten it. And, they, and they're at the club every night and they're surrounded by crowds and throngs of people. So clearly it, it's, um, it's protective. But I think a, a, the easier the mask is to breathe in, presumably the, the less effective it is. Right. So, so those ones that really cover your face, like that, that people, it's too hard to breathe in them. First of all, it's not that hard to breathe in them. You get used to it. But the reason it's hard to breathe in them is because you're, a higher percentage of the air you're taking is being filtered. Right, and the right. filter slows down the air. So people like the KN95, but there's gaps. And you know the air comes in through the gaps. I, I'm, I wouldn't be sure that 100% of the air is not coming in through the gap. I don't know. By the way, you ever uh, suck on a mint whilst wearing a mask? No, it gets you high? No, well, it doesn't get you high. But what happens is, is the like... The, the minty air is is funneled through the top of the mask right over your eyeballs, and it's just like a sting. Oh. Kind of fun. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting. But um, I mean, I, I was, I'm so happy I didn't have it because I didn't, I, you know, we have one unvaccinated child in the house, and I, I don't want him to get it, although the, the risks are, are low for children, but I, you know, who needs that stress? I know it's it's I agree. It's like somebody said to me, oh, what are you? I'm, I'm assuming you're like back in your bunker. And I'm like, you're assuming correctly. And they're like, well, you know, you can't hide from the virus. By and the I, way, <laughs> well, I I can be like super fucking careful, though, and try not to get it. You know, you can't hide from Hitler, don't you? <laughs> <laughs> you should just report to the camps. No, what is the uh, what is at what point am I authorized to return to the cellar for spots? What after you test negative uh, after I, I, whatever, whatever, the, whatever it's like seven days or you have to test negative. I don't know. Well, do I Liz have knows to, the rules precisely? Do I have to present Liz with uh, any sort of proof? I, I don't. I, I don't think so. I mean, I can't imagine that you. What I'm getting that. at is that I was supposed to be in Aruba over New Year's. Oh, you want to work New Year's? Yeah, we're probably well, if need there's you. an opening if somebody COVID. Yeah, there's, there's definitely going to be an opening, um, unless we have to. Unless we have to. Can't people are going out? So, I mean, what a time! It's what a crazy time. Wait, what about this? So a comic actually who a seller comic was positive and he told me that his he was he isolated for 10 days and he told me that his doctor told him after 10 days not to take another PCR test because he might still test positive because the virus is still in his system. Yeah, yeah, I've I've seen that that the PCR test is so sensitive that it can it can detect traces of the virus long after you're not infectious anymore long so uh, what does that mean like for the kids to go back to school like if they tested positive for example you weren't allowed to send them back until you could present the nurse with a negative test like i thought that was sort of the deal for everything like what dan is saying i i, I don't know i'm not up on it I, I know these are these things get revised but i but i think that i've heard this over and over that they they 10, 10 days after a positive and zero symptoms um, is, you know, is 
is very reliable. But the thing about having no symptoms is that I don't know if I really believe people when they say they have no symptoms or they don't realize they have symptoms because everybody, even throughout a 24 hour period has some congestion, coughs, a little mucus, a little phlegm. These, these are everyday things and you don't think they're symptoms be, because you have no way of knowing if they're symptoms, right? I mean, I mean, Dan had a real cold, right? But like a little sort of a little, oh, I swallowed. That was, I felt a little something when I swallowed. That's not a symptom, but maybe it was, you know? Also oh, brain fog. I mean, we know people that have had brain fog uh, for years. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, so I don't mean to scare you then, but the brain fog is, would, would worry me. Well, I know you had. Should I say it slower? The brain fog. <laughs> I know you had mentioned, you know, long COVID. Some people have continued bra brain fog, and you wouldn't even necessarily notice if you only say lost one IQ point, assuming that's yeah. something that could happen. You might not notice that, right? I I have to do sort of puzzles or so. I have to take you know an SAT or something to know notice it. But um, but I guess if you don't notice, it's not that big a deal. Whereas, um, whereas smell and taste is something obvious, you know, you'll know if that that's permanently been uh, altered. Yeah. So, so I read today that the the long COVID is is much less correlated with the vaccines. But you took the J and J, and I don't even know if that's a vaccine. I, I don't know what that is. Well, of course, I mean it's it's. What do you mean you don't know if it's a vaccine? I mean it it's it it was okay. Harry Anton and I were laughing because at the time, like way back when we, like in the, within a few weeks, we knew that a single shot of Moderna was more protective than the J and J. We knew this way back when. And then, the, and then the, I told you this at the time, and then the data on J and J has just gotten less and less impressive to the point now where they're not even recommending it anymore. Can you uh, take a Moderna vac uh, booster with the Johnson and Johnson vaccine? You're not seriously still asking me this question after six months of me telling you, yes. I knew that with Pfizer. I didn't know if that was also any. You can take them with anything. They, there is no, there is no. You can mix the vaccines. As a matter of fact, some people think it's even more protective. Well, all I know is that the people I've spoken with that have Omicron that were given these other vaccines don't seem to be in any better off than I am. If that's an indication of the effectiveness of the booster that I got, which was J and J. Yeah, well, you don't know people who've been boosted and you don't know who's ace. I don't know. And I, I feel weird asking. Like one person I spoke with said that she was having such high fever that she was hallucinating. And I didn't ask her, are you boosted? Because I felt like that's such like nowadays to ask that question, it almost feels. Yeah, well, maybe she's having, maybe she's having high fever is because uh, she's hallucinating it. Alina Chan is here. I'm going to let her in. I really am interested in your prediction, Noam, so that we can look back at this. And I also want to know if you've had Omicron, does that protect you from not getting it again? Getting, not getting Omicron again? Yeah. Yeah, probably. I mean, okay. if it's like any other virus. Yeah, probably. All right. I'm going to let her in. Stand by. Question is, does it protect, does it protect you from Delta? We don't know that. Ugh. <clears throat> or syphilis. Hi. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can't see you. Oh, yeah. I'm starting the video. Okay. okay. We have Hi. There she is. Da, 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 da. Have Hi. we had her on before, Alina Chan? No. Uh, no. Alina I, Chan, a brief intro, Alina, if I may. Alina Chan is a Canadian molecular biologist. We have a lot of Canadian guests, and they're always wonderful people. So, welcome. <laughs> Uh, specializing in gene therapy and cell engineering at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard, where she is a postdoctoral fellow. And she's co-author of Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19. Welcome, Alina Chan. And thank you for, for zooming in from your camping trip. <laughs> uh, Alina, are you in Canada now? That looks No, I, I wish I was in Canada now, but this, this is yes, from the Rockies. That's from the Rockies. Eighty and Rockies, but you're in in Massachusetts right now. Yes, Harvard. Uh, yeah, the the Broad Institute. Uh, yeah. So so we what, we you first came on our radar because of this the you know the the the, the origins of of COVID um, uh, stuff that you're writing. But since we're in the middle of a of a new historic chapter in COVID, maybe we can ask a few questions on get get your take on everything that's going on now. Sure. Um. Should I leave it open ended, or should we ask you questions? Like, what, like, what's on the top of your brain about all this uh, Omicron stuff? Well, we are seeing it 
uh, spread very quickly. So it's it's clear to us now that it's highly transmissible. Uh, so what people are hoping is that the higher vaccination rates will protect against severe outcomes for most of the people infected by it. But the problem is that if you have just millions of people getting infected with this, you will see uh, hospitals being overwhelmed. So I think it's still good for people to be careful in this in this time. You don't want to be one of the rare people having to be in the hospital at this time. So my friend Dan uh, there, he, he we just found out he, he has COVID, presumably Omicron, because Omicron seems to be Taking uh, over. 100%. Well, um, yeah. now he he did something very foolish. He took the J and J vaccine. What what do you want? What what, what do we know now about that? They gave me. Periel made me an appointment in the Bronx. So bad enough, I had to go all the way to the Bronx. But then the story doesn't end there because when I got there, what they had was the J and J. Wasn't my decision. So what do? Because because I because let me, let me preface this. I think a lot of the guidance we've gotten from the government has been very mealy mouthed about just saying the blunt truth. For instance, I think we're a year past the time when the government should have been telling people, don't take the J&J, there's no scarcity, take the mRNA. Similarly, we're way past the time when the government should have been saying, wear a mask, as opposed to wear an N95 mask. If you're, if you're not wearing an N95 mask, you're really not wearing a mask at all. So what, what do you say about those kind of messaging things? So the J and J is still effective, but at the po- at this point, it's really about the number of doses you have received, right? So even people who took the Moderna and the Pfizer, the two shots, they still have to go back in for a third shot. So they still have to get like boosters, and this is going to be a thing in future. Is that every, let's say, six months or so, people who are more vulnerable, so elderly people with pre-existing conditions, will need to get boosted, uh, especially people who travel a lot. So people who are just on planes all the time. <laughs> or going to, you know, comedy salaries or to uh, public events where there are hundreds of people coming in from anywhere, they will need to be constantly boosted because, you, again, you, you don't want to take that risk that maybe uh, you don't have very long lasting immunity and you get exposed, you might catch it. So ultimately, hopefully these vaccines, they will prevent against severe outcomes, but it doesn't mean that you won't get infected. But it, the severe outcomes, yeah, that's great. But the, mm-hmm. but the um, mRNA, especially the Moderna, seems to really increase your chance of preventing infection, which to me also means your chance of spreading it to your kids or your grandmother or whatever it is. So it seems- so One thing to know is that the Moderna dosage is actually quite higher, much higher than the Pfizer dosage. So it's actually three times the dose. So wow. I got I got the Moderna. So okay. essentially you're getting six doses versus the two doses that uh, the Pfizer is <laughs> getting. So, uh, I would speculate that that's one factor. <laughs> if you're getting six times of something versus two times of something, like it's you, you would expect a much uh, more robust immune response, right? Yeah, and well, that's right. And I, I, I just took my fourth shot four months after my booster, just like Israel is now recommending four shot of Moderna. Um, and what about masks? <laughs> uh, N90. I mean, N90. Why are people wearing cloth masks? What? Why? Why? I mean, talk about all the stuff that the government could have done for zero money a year ago. They could have been telling people very clearly: do not wear cloth masks, and you know, wear N95 masks. There was no scarcity; they're not expensive. The government could give them out if they wanted. Well, how do you explain that? Well, I I know that it's scarce in some countries. <laughs> so, talk about uh, America, America. Yeah, yeah, but I've heard some of my friends even asking for people here in the US to send N95s to them. So I would say that there's probably some concerns about messaging globally. But yes, I agree within a wealthy country like America, they could probably afford to tell people a bit more about how to arm themselves against like infections. Um, I think part of the problem is that it's taken quite a long time for the public health authorities to grapple with the fact that this virus is airborne. So a lot of the messaging we heard in the early days was about hand washing. So this, this is still stuck in my mind, like how much hand washing we had to do. It's just like singing the birthday song twice while you're washing your hands and like <laughs> my kids did that. washing everything, washing your chips, washing, you know, <laughs> everything you buy from the grocery, grocery store when the, when the thing we should have been really concerned about was being stuck in like meeting rooms or, or train or cars or like buses where people are just breathing the same air for extended periods of time. I think the focus was was pretty uh, <laughs> misinformed, I would say. It, it, it came from a place where they weren't thinking about how this virus is usually transmitting. 
Yeah, I'm wearing an N100 mask now. Well, <laughs> I'm not. I'm not messing around. Uh, for, for last question, or maybe uh, my, there's more. But so it used to, they used to tell us you needed to be, as you said, prolonged period of time with somebody breathing the same air. They was, it was like a 15 minute rule. I know that was probably not that accurate, but it, it was some sort of approximation of how long. Of course, the closer you are and, and the sicker they yeah. are, these, all these variables. But and but they and they say that uh, Omicron is 70, something like 70 times more contagious, whatever that means. It does that mean that it takes one seventh of the time <laughs> of breathing the same air? What does it mean? No, I don't think they measure it like that. They, they measure it by the number of people get infected by the same person. So they, they, they measure the, the speed of spreading and the size of the clusters. Uh, uh, that start from Omicron versus the original uh, virus. So, right. but the speed uh, of spreading is related to the fact that if people are getting yeah quicker, but, right? But they don't measure like how long does it take for someone to be in the same room as someone else. I think that that might be difficult to measure and maybe even unethical <laughs> so, <laughs> if you try to expose someone for like three seconds to someone else in the same room. But it, it's probably safe to say that if you thought you could be, if you thought ten minutes was safe, you it's probably not. It, it whatever you thought was safe or whatever was safe that yeah. high, whatever that cosmic reality number is it's definitely accelerated now, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, I wouldn't say that people should be holding a timer though and going into a room of someone else and saying, okay, like 70 seconds are up and I'm going to leave now. So I think the best way is just to be ex extra cautious and to do everything outdoors if possible. And uh, go ahead, Dan, you have any questions? Well, I just think uh, I was wondering if uh, your opinion about Noam's uh, um, opinion about Johnson & Johnson, if he's being unfair <laughs> and... Uh, you know, us Johnson & Johnson people have taken a lot of crap <laughs> the past few months, and we're kind of tired of it. Well, I, I have to say that I actually wanted the John & Johnson & Johnson. I wanted to get this over with as quickly as possible, right? So the, the one shot really appealed to me. Uh, but uh, right when I became eligible to get vaccinated, because I'm not in any vulnerable population, uh, that's when they actually had that pause on the J&J, &J, is that they said that they were seeing uh, some rare, very rare effects in women of my age group. So that's when I, I was like, yeah, then I can't get that now. <laughs> so uh, so then I went to the nearest uh, CVS and they had the Moderna for me. Well, she's, she's, she's giving some credit to your opinion, Dan, but I, I would have to, uh, even though I have no business, I'm just a a club owner, I, having read what I've read, I would say if you take the J&J &J right now, people at home, you, that is not, if you're worried about, if you're worried about getting COVID, you, you take the, the Moderna right now. That's what I, based on what we know now, that could change tomorrow. We could find out anything, but you have, you have to go with what the best information you have at the time. I'd say any any vaccine within your reach is, is what you need now. It's so if it's yeah, it's better than nothing. Yeah. So I think well, getting getting a, a booster like Pfizer or Moderna is, is very good in this climate where Omicron is just spreading like crazy. Like you look at some places like Washington DC and it's a the line is it's just vertical. <laughs> the number of cases is just vertical. Oh, so New York too. Although I, I I went online today and I made an appointment for my wife for a fourth uh moderna and you can you can get a moderna shot today in new york city if you want to and christmas eve is really all clear so it you know it's worth saying we're so lucky to live in these countries that we live in you know i can't even imagine what they're going through in other parts of the world now uh, whatever it's really it, we're so lucky well let's get into uh the uh the book that alina has written uh, in which uh, she asserts that the origin of COVID was in a lab. Is that correct? So I, I don't say that it's definitely from a lab, but I, I do lean towards a lab origin of the virus. But the whole book asserts that what we need is an investigation. So right now, there's no direct evidence for either a natural or lab-based origin. What needs to happen is a systematic and credible uh, investigation that involves not only scientists, but also forensic investigators. So, so intelligence officers, other experts who can go and go in and understand what is the most likely origin of this virus? What, what sorts of evidence should we be collecting? How can we uh, get to a more confident assessment? So let me ask you like a, a broad question. I, I'm presuming because you have a slight accent that you were, you were not born in Canada and that, 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 that where were you born? Actually, I was born in Canada. <laughs> but, right? Yeah, yeah, but I, I was uh, raised in Singapore and, then, oh, and okay. then I went back to Canada as a teenager. It's kind of really messy. And I, I feel like a lot of people my age have that kind of messy 
<laughs> that's, 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 a story. But that's why I said it's a slight accent. But anyway, so like if 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 my wife if if my wife uh, accused me of cheating, and I wouldn't show her my cell phone, <laughs> uh, sh- that would be all. That would be it. Like that's it's clear I'm cheating, right? So so in a different cultural environment, you say, well, it, if they won't let, they won't allow us to investigate. It, it, that's that's all I need to know. But is there is there a cultural explanation? which would account for the, the Chinese being re- reluctant to give us information or to be open with us, that that would not be the fact that they're hiding, you know, the fact that it was that, that you know, evidence of a lab leak. So some people on the side of the natural origin, so I'm talking about people who very strongly believe that this virus came out of an animal at the market. They think that the Chinese government might even be covering up evidence of a natural origin. They think that China wants to not even say that this virus came came from that country, uh, but they're blaming it on like lobsters from Maine or like uh, salmon from the Faroe Islands or like a, a pangolin from Thailand or something. So they're trying to place the origin outside of the country so that China takes zero responsibility for the virus. And how do you how how much do you credit that? Well, it's also speculation, so we need to investigate. I, I'd say that all these uh, theories of it coming from lobster and that kind of thing, that completely bunk. <laughs> so, uh, it's not really worth any time or energy looking into uh, because there's no precedent. There's no example of another respiratory virus emerging and causing an outbreak from frozen foods. So there's no there's no like previous SARS or even MERS virus like emerging from from a block of like frozen shrimp and causing an outbreak <laughs> at a buffet. So well, this, this is not even a viable hypothesis. So I guess I guess I'm, I'm real, as I'm thinking out loud, I, there's another question then. Do the Chinese like I'm, I was presuming until a second ago, the Chinese know what the evidence is. They just won't share it with us. Uh, they know whether it came from a, a natural origin or not. Do, do you agree that they know? I agree that they have a lot more information than us and they're not sharing that information. So, for example, information about early cases, uh, they claim that they could not identify any cases earlier than December 2019, which I find to be quite incredible because they had the world's best ex- experts in that city, in that city of Wuhan. They had arguably the world's best lab at tracking these SARS-like outbreaks in that city. Like this was a home ground. So for them to not to suddenly have forgotten how to do all the basics of tracking a SARS-like outbreak is not very believable to me. Um, when the World Health Organization sent some experts in there this year in January, they could not access any primary data. So they were not shared. Uh, they didn't see any like hospital records. They couldn't interview anyone they wanted, just the people who had been picked out for them by the Chinese authorities. So I, I bet that there's a lot of very critical information not being shared with the rest of the world. Um, they, I, I mean, I don't want to keep dominating the questions. I have more questions. You guys want to ask anything? No, what, go ahead. Uh, what, what would be the, um, <clears throat> if it was indeed a lab, uh, a lab based virus is, does that mean that this was um, done on purpose, or if it was if it was um, an accident, where it escaped from the lab by accident? So I, I can say that there's there's nothing that makes me think that this was done on purpose, because this would just be self sabotage <laughs> in the worst extreme. So like it, it looks like they had they were very surprised by this, uh, and you can be surprised by a lab accident too. So for example. This virus, SARS-CoV-2, that causes COVID-19, actually escaped from a high biosecurity lab in Taiwan recently. Uh, The case was diagnosed only on December 9, and by December 20, (laughs) just a couple of days ago, they cracked it. They confirmed that it leaked from the lab. But the fact remains that this person was infected. She had been fully vaccinated with Moderna. She was in her 20s. Uh, She walked around town, developed symptoms, and didn't get tested for even a week. Only when she lost her sense of smell and taste, then she went and got a COVID test. So everybody was shocked. Everyone was surprised. So I'd say that even even if this came from a lab, uh, people can be very surprised. So I, I don't think that it was a deliberate um, like a deliberate release of of a of a weapon or, or virus. And this this virus or so, if you had been studying it in a lab, you wouldn't have known that it could spread like asymptomatically in humans. That kind of thing. So it's it's very difficult to know. Uh, how a virus re- will behave in humans, uh, even if you study it in a lab. So now, I, yeah, I don't think it was on purpose. Uh, that I mean, I think only, I mean, I, I, I don't think many people b- believe it was on purpose, except for like, you know, nutty people. But that's to be distinguished from the issue of whether it was the product of some gain of function research, which I don't have an opinion on, but I know that's out there. What, what, what can you tell us about that? 
So it, it's on the table. So it's on the table whether or not this virus was genetically modified and potentially enhanced, uh, whether intentionally or unintentionally. The reason why I say that is because of a document that was leaked in September of this year. It's called the Diffuse Proposal. It was a research proposal submitted by uh, an organization actually in, in New York City. It's called the Eco Health Alliance. And they were collaborating with uh, other scientists in the US as well as the Wuhan Institute of Virology, so the WIV. And in this proposal in early 2018, they told the, the funders that they wanted to insert novel cleavage sites into novel SARS-like viruses. So it sounds it sounds very complex, but the analogy I use is it's like you find this proposal that says, we're gonna put horns on horses, and at the end of 2019, a unicorn shows up in the city <laughs> of one of the people who on that proposal. So when you see that kind of striking coincidence, you're like, yeah, maybe this unicorn is not a product of nature. <laughs> maybe we need to investigate and see whether these scientists had actually collected a unicorn. Maybe they had found a rare SARS-like virus with a rare cleavage site. Or maybe they put it together in the lab as part of their plan, which is not a conspiracy. It's literally what they wrote. Well, the, the, your analogy leans towards of course this is a gain of fun yeah you may, that may not be your intention but obviously if i see a unicorn i mean that would have been enough for me but this may not be as as uh, uh you know ridiculous as that well um, but some some of the scientists on the natural origin side so they say that other animals have horns too <laughs> so, oh, right. so deer, you know like moose and all these other animals they, they also have things protruding from their heads so it's possible it's it's technically possible that there are horses on there very rare horses that have horns on their head and that maybe it's just a big coincidence that a unicorn shows up in a city where the scientists said they were going to put horns on horses so i still i still leave a natural origin on the table but what is clear is that it is knowable. We can actually go to the Eco Health Alliance based in New York City and ask them to share their documents and exchanges with us. Um, I have I have two more questions come to mind. One is kind of political. So, did you see the the um, miniseries Chernobyl? I think it was on HBO. About yeah, I watched that. Yeah. yeah, and and so there were a lot of there were a lot of parallels to that. One of them, just to, as an aside, was that early on they said. Uh, well, it's only 30 rengen of radioactivity, uh, just like a chest X-ray. And, and it turned out, well, that was the limit of the Geiger counters. Mm -hmm. that, re that reminded <laughs> me very early of when they were saying there's only 50 cases of COVID in New York, but, but that was just, we only had 50 tests, right? So it clearly it was much, much higher. So, but, but another lesson kind of Chernobyl is just how incompetent dictatorships are and just how perverse the incentives are in, within a dictatorship. So you would imagine in a Western lab, if something is unsafe, a Western scientist would hopefully immediately blow the whistle, go to the supervisor, call the papers, whatever it is. Whereas I fear that a scientist working in China would just keep their head down and be very afraid. I'm not gonna be the one to blow the whistle on this. I could get killed or something like that. Is that, am I right about that? And do you think that that would mean that Chinese labs in general just are more dangerous and we can't trust them. Well, I think that some cultures definitely favor more cover up and not less transparency because they're life and death situations. So yes. if you if you tell the government something that you don't like, your whole family could get disappeared or all your students could get disappeared. So I don't see it as a judgment on, on people, but I see it no. as a judgment on the situation that they're putting in. The system, in. dictatorships. That being, yeah. that being said, I'd say that even in the US, there's a lot of cover up. <laughs> so, that nobody likes to admit to, to wrongdoing, whether it's a mistake or whether it's something bad that was done on int like intentionally. So wherever we, we are, there are ways to make things more transparent, to incentivize or to mandate reporting of mistakes made. So for example, in the US, uh, there is a mandatory reporting of uh, exposures, accidental exposures or losses of select agents. So these select agents are the, the most terrifying toxins and pathogens around. And we know from records that in 2019, there were on average more than four accidental exposures or losses of select agents per week, more than four per week on average in the US in 2019. So that's only the worst of the worst pathogens. Before this pandemic, if you look at SARS-CoV-2, no one would have said it was a select agent. Uh, they would have said it was just a regular virus. In fact, in fact, the scientists in Wuhan were experimenting with similar viruses at a very low biosafety level, uh, BSL-2. 
this is a level where even if you get sick, you don't have to tell anybody. Even if you spill things on the floor, you may not have to tell anybody. <laughs> so uh, that that is this. I, I think now everyone around the world should have a much more uh, cautious approach to working with novel pathogens. Uh, but I'd say that it's probably more difficult in places where there's less of a culture of transparency. Yeah, I have I have a fundamental deep mistrust about any dictatorship. This is definitely not about Chinese people because I, the example I gave was Russians um, of, of any dictatorship like Iran handling nuclear material or whatever it is. I just don't believe they will have any protocols. I, I picture like the the circuit breakers in the Iranian nuclear lab, you know, with duct tape on them. So they because they're blowing all, all this. Like I just I, I think we in the West don't fully understand how how different these authoritarian dictatorships are and how that translates into real risk of them handling technologies that can end the world or, or, or ruin it, you know, it, it scares me. I don't yeah, know. and there are very practical things we can do to make even research in, in these dictatorships more transparent. And people kind of don't believe me, but these are very small steps that can have a tremendous effect. And one of them is that in, in the scientific community that these top journals that are kind of like the the most prized places for people to publish their work if these journals all just agreed that we will no longer publish any more research where pathogens are enhanced whether intentionally or not if they all agree i'm not going to publish any more papers where i see you've been sitting on novel pathogens for years and years this would eliminate the problem <laughs> almost immediately because no one will want to work on things where they cannot publish in these top places. Mm -hmm. And another another way is just to build a very luxurious research island somewhere where all of the researchers can go from any country to do this research in the most safest, most <laughs> controlled manner. So it shouldn't be, you know, in Alaska <laughs> or like an Antarctica or something. It should be in, in, a, in a really nice place, maybe one of the Caribbean islands or something, but <laughs> a place where all the scientists will be begging their bosses, like, please let me go here so I can do this dangerous research. And then everyone there is quarantined um, and properly tested and contact traced even after they leave quarantine. So that way we, we bring all of the research around the world into this very transparent place into a place where all the, all the work is being uh, done openly. That, that way we don't have right now the situation where we have dozens of pathogen labs spread out across the world, all engaging in research that we have no idea what it is. Yeah, we go to that island and there's horses with horns on them, and <laughs> <laughs> like the island of Dr. Moreau. <laughs> Daniel, Maybe a bit. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what island uh, would volunteer to be the, uh, the location for this. I mean, we should use the one from Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, the islands are all taken, you know, at this point. And uh, so I have another question. Maybe you hear Rikers you, Island here in New York City. Rikers Island. Uh, uh, we, we, uh, we hear a lot of like pop scientific truisms that the virus wants to get less lethal because that's how a virus you know and i'm I, I i'm not sure that's not a simplistic way of presenting this it seems to me that a mutation is random mm -hmm. and that it's not because a virus has any will or there's any particular force making it less lethal that this particular omicron mutation was less lethal as opposed to more lethal if it was then if it were le more lethal and then it began to compete against the similarly transmissible virus that was less lethal then the less lethal virus would eventually win out over a long term which is natural selection so in the end 100 years from now yes we would see the less lethal virus but i think people are putting too much faith in this kind of idea that just inextricably, the virus is going to get less lethal. Am I right about that? Yes. And so we actually discussed this in the book. And the reason for some of this hypothesis uh, is actually that some virologists had brought it up several years ago. But th those virologists had written those hypotheses without being aware that a virus like SARS-CoV-2 would appear in 2019. And, and SARS-CoV-2 has some very striking characteristics that are different from other viruses. So it can spread before a person even shows symptoms. So uh, <laughs> if, right. if half of the transmissions are happening before symptoms appear, then it doesn't matter what it's like after it after symptoms appear and it has an extremely long incubation time of 14 days so 5 to 14 days which is the first SARS virus was like 3 to 5 days or 5 to 7 days so 
imagine a person being able to to think that they're not sick for two weeks, but they're just traveling everywhere, you know, going to all the weddings and funerals they want to, <laughs> and then accidentally super spreader events happen. Uh, and, and this virus also it, it has this whole range of symptoms. So it's not, you, you don't necessarily get a fever or a cough or sore throat. Some people even just have uh, like diarrhea. That's the only <laughs> symptom that they have just because the virus is infecting a different part of your body. Right. So in this case where you're so confused about whether or not you have COVID-19 or something else, the flu or allergies, it's really difficult to contain this virus. So I don't think that we can apply any of the old rules to this virus anymore. It's even difficult to tell whether Omicron is, is milder because so many people now have been infected with co uh, by the original SARS-CoV-2 virus. They don't know whether they were or not. But that means that there's some subset of the population that has pre-existing immunity. They just don't know. They're not necessarily aware. And so many of us are now vaccinated. So it's difficult to estimate whether or not this virus, uh, this new variant, Omicron, is more, uh, is milder compared to the original not. Un unless you have unless you intentionally expose <laughs> similar groups of people to this virus and then see what well, happens. No, we can hope that the dictatorships do that for us and then, <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> uh, but you know, they will. Um, uh, I, but I do have one kind of theory, not a theory, but one pot, like a, it just occurred to me. What if in general, it was more difficult for a virus, given all the different possibilities of DNA, like if you, if you could, if you had every single possible combination of, uh, of DNA out there, what if it's less likely just in general for a virus to be lethal because it has to all come together just perfectly to actually be lethal, then just because the odds are less likely for a virus to be lethal, you would see a virus most likely becoming less lethal with mutations just based on probabilities, right? I'm not too sure about that. So um, the way I think about uh, virus evolution or um, generally evolution is, is that it's exploring a landscape, a landscape with a lot of mountains and valleys. And depending on how it travels and, and how many, how much travel is allowed. So for example, if SARS-CoV-2, we allowed it to spread through at least 300 million people today. Uh, it has traveled all over this landscape. So it's not necessarily traveling towards a place of lower lethality or to a place of higher transmissibility. It's just where it goes and, and how even just luck or chance is that if someone carries a, a variant that has higher transmissibility and they go attend like a wedding, then that's it. Like <laughs> it just goes boom and, and the whole world catches in. So there's a lot of luck and chance at play and it depends where the virus is traveling at that time. I think Noam was asking is, is, is a random mutation more or less likely to be lethal? Oh, um, so a random mutation is most likely to be a loss of function, but that doesn't translate to loss of lethality. It, it means that the virus might be less capable of infecting people in the first place or less capable of uh, replicating itself. So yeah, making right. more copies of itself. Yeah. Um, and uh, I guess the final question, let's get, we have more is, um, how well, do you follow that? up on that very briefly, Noam? Yeah, sure, of course. But I don't know that we've necessarily answered Noam's question. So do we, do we, as a general matter, see viruses getting less lethal, more lethal over time, or, or it, it, we can't say. Uh, we can't say, because let's say it has a random mutation that tends to lead to a loss of function. So that means that this mutant doesn't get given to the next person. So it's less fit, it's less, uh, it doesn't win the, the survival of the fittest uh, experiment. Only the fittest get transmitted and, and lead to super spreader events. So these, uh, there's some element of luck there. So maybe, maybe someone is very sick for a long time and they've evolved this very highly transmissible uh, variant, but if they live in a cabin in the woods somewhere and nobody ever comes to visit them while they're sick, like that, that's a dead end. Uh, but if someone else who carries a less transmissible variant or something, but hosts like a thousand person pool party, <laughs> everyone that gets infected, that virus has much more of a running start. So th there's some element of luck there. Uh, but I'd say generally, uh, most random mutations lead to loss of function and are not given a chance to spread. Yeah, I, I was kind of thinking of the analogy of like, if there's, if there's a million lottery tickets for, mm -hmm. for and uh, only 20 of them are winning tickets, Mm -hmm. And you have a winning ticket. That's the that's the lethal virus. It you just right. It's lethal. And then your your ticket mutates, and you get a different ticket number. There's only 19 other 
lethal uh, viruses out there. So you're likely to become less uh, lethal simply because the odds of lethality are more remote than the odds of um, non-lethality. I don't know if that's true scientifically. I'm just saying if that were true scientifically, that could explain why they become, that would be a non-natural selection reason why it becomes less lethal. That's just something I was thinking about. And then you can give me your theories about comedy after that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm thinking about that. And I, I think it would differ from virus to virus because like each virus is so complex. It's, it's like this moving parts. It's like a complex of at least like 20 moving parts in some of these viruses. Yeah. So you don't necessarily know what, what are the changes to make to make a virus more or less lethal. So it's tough to know whether it's easily within reach for it to mutate and become lethal or right. not. Although I'd say that this question is what drives a lot of gain of function research. So there's some scientists who said that their friends dared them to make a virus more lethal or transmissible, and they wanted to prove that they could do it. So they did it. So I'd say that Sometimes they find that the answer is a lot closer than we expect, uh, but a lot of scientists don't think that this type of work should be done because of how easy it is to, to find a more dangerous virus and, and how easy it is for these viruses to escape from the lab and cause an outbreak. What do you think? Yeah, I think that this work should be, again, put on a very remote island <laughs> where you'd be bring all the people from every country and they all just do it on this single island where there's very good surveillance of the wastewater from all the labs and everything and the people entering and leaving. Um, then you can you can have a blast, like just do whatever you want on this island, <laughs> but don't don't put it in like every major city. Like why is why are these labs being placed in Boston and Wuhan City, you know, in Singapore? Like it makes no sense that these would be within 20 minutes drive of the nearest international airport and within a half hour train ride to the nearest like you know uh wet market or like uh, all the could hospitals we, could we see another black death scenario which killed a third of the people in europe is that possible that that could happen again or does modern medical technology make that impossible or very unlikely I think it it depends on luck and and what what types of viruses we see in the future. But I'd say that one very important movement that's emerged because of COVID nineteen is is this COVID is airborne movement. So there are some scientists who say that we need a revolution in how we think about clean air. So with with all these very long time ago pandemics, the solution was just cleaning the water. So just telling people you shouldn't be drinking out of the toilets anymore <laughs> and the water should be filtered and, and things like clean before it uh, goes into everyone's homes. So they're saying that we need the same kind of thing today, but with air. So filtering the air with HEPA filters, like having buildings built so that there's more airflow, uh, just very simple things, but they they somehow require quite quite a cataclysmic revolution in how we build buildings. Should should we prepare for the nuclear option? So uh, from what I read, they can turn around now these mRNA vaccines very, very, very quickly. I have it on the drawing board literally within hours and and then it, within a couple of weeks, they could actually have a, have a vaccine ready to test. And of course, that's what is that uh, Moore's law? Is that what it is, Dan? Uh, the the that, that, that's to do with computers. right. But by analogy, you you would presume that this is going to speed. Every technology speeds up that way, and before you know it, it'll be like Star Trek. They'll be able to have the actual vaccine within within a few hours, and then the rest is testing. But of course, how long you test and what your protocols are for testing are are measured against the risk of what it is. So if you have time to test, you test. But what if Omicron? Everybody's just dropping dead. Uh, should there be a nuclear option where we we're, we're, we're all geared up to produce a virus immediately? I mean, pr produce a vaccine immediately. Should we determine that? Listen, we just can't test. We're just going to have we're just going to have to go for it based on everything we know in the past because the risk of not vaccinating is, you know, is is much higher than the risk of of uh, letting this thing spread. Should that be where we're going in terms of? pandemic policy. Yes. And so a lot of money should be invested into uh, vaccine manufacturing infrastructure. So even in this pandemic, it was quite a miracle that the mRNA vaccines worked because it was the first time it was being deployed on such a wide scale in humans uh, that a lot of people are skeptical, right? So even till today, a lot of people will not take the mRNA because they're so fearful that this new technology hasn't been uh, tracked for enough years. So and most someone who's been in the trials has has maybe one and a half years of, of safety tracking. So, so not, not a lifetime tracking, but I think um, 
the money for future uh, pandemic preparedness should go into diagnostics and vaccine uh, manufacturing and distribution. So even I, I think we're even test driving that right now because with the Omicron, like when are we going to get updated boosters? When are we going to get a booster that is targeted towards the Delta Omicron the Alpha, uh, maybe even a cocktail vaccine, one where you're given all three spikes at once so that you develop a very uh, robust immune response to a diverse a range of variants. So I, I wish that would come out faster. I would rather get that as a booster than more of the uh, SARS-2 1.0. Uh, but I think it might take time. It might take even till like April. Yeah. Well, yeah. by that time, everybody will be naturally boosted again. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I hope we're just working towards a time when in, you know, in what's this, 2021, in 2040, mm -hmm. when a, a, there's a few cases of a virus and they immediately can produce Produce a vaccine and, and stop it in its tracks. You know that's um, it seems that seems possible, right? Is there evidence now that um, if you've contracted Omicron, that you're then protected from getting it again? So I think most most likely, if if you're a young and healthy person, or if you're healthy in general, and you get exposed to a particular variant of the virus, you will develop a robust immune response to it, and that will protect you from reinfection with at least the same variant. So if you get infected by Omicron, you should be protected against Omicron. Uh, but the issue is that there are lots of pockets of people who are not, uh, who don't have very uh, healthy immune responses. Um, and if you're a person like you're a doctor or a nurse or a teacher, where you're just constantly surrounded by people getting sick, <laughs> then even if you have a strong immune response, just constant bombardment of the virus on you, uh, means that you still have a good chance of getting reinfected. What, what if we run out of Greek letters? <laughs> do we use another alphabet or do we start with alpha, but say alpha two? Oh, they, they say it's now uh, going to the constellations. Oh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, I guess, how do you see this all ending and, and has Omicron hastened that ending? So I don't think that this is going to end anytime soon. And, and this speaks to the unequal burden of a pandemic on, on the globe is that there are some countries where there would just never be proper vaccine distribution. So at any time in the future, there will always be places where this virus is just having a free like joy ride <laughs> and just evolving into whatever new variant there is. So even with influenza, with the flu, we get a new vaccine every year. And at the beginning of every year, they have to pick the strain like what they predict will be the main flu uh, epidemic that year, and they give us that vaccine. So the same thing will happen with COVID-19. There's no way to eradicate it now. Even if you shut everyone in their houses miraculously for 2.5 months, like Wuhan did, it is in the animals in our country too, like deer are infected, uh, probably other animals are infected too, we're not sure yet. So unless you, you wipe out all these other animals <laughs> and shut everyone up in the house for 2.5 months, there's no way to eradicate this uh, virus. There's an interesting additional irony. I don't know if it's true or not, but if it's true, it's an additional irony that they say that this extensive mutation of Omicron might be because it developed within a person with AIDS who the irony is was being kept alive with antiviral technology, which is now allowing viruses to mutate. You, you, you give any credence to that theory? Yeah, so the, the, I think at least a few hypotheses of how Omicron might have emerged, and one of them is this, is that it was in an immunocompromised person for extended period of time, maybe more than a year even. So what this means is that in some immunocompromised people, they, they don't have the ability to clear the virus from their body. So it's always there at some low level, and maybe even at the undetectable level, but one day it flares up again, and that's when accidents can happen, an outbreak can happen. Uh, some other hypotheses include it being an animal reservoir. So maybe being in a pool of animals that has only occasional contact with humans. And after a while, it's spilled back into humans after we gave it to them. So it's like exchanging <laughs> variants, uh, punching each other in the faces repeatedly. <laughs> but uh, um, the one, one, one more is that it might have even been in a village or a small population of uh, people or a country where there's very li little surveillance. And so when that happens and you don't track the spread of a virus in some countries for a year. And, and that's, that's probably quite true for some places in Africa and, and South America, other places that have very little surveillance um, because of issues of resources, not having enough resources to go out there, collect samples and sequence them and put the data online. That's when you, you have all these blind spots around the world. 
and anytime someone who just travels to the main city could give what they have that to, to that city. So uh, this whole um, Omicron thing, it really says we need to be doing more surveillance of immunocompromised uh, patients, of, of animal populations, and of places that are underserved, that don't have the resources to be surveilling uh, the spread of COVID-19. Well, I, I don't want to pat ourselves on the back, but I don't think I've ever heard a more informative interview <laughs> on the subject of, of, of COVID than this is. They should, they should run this interview on CNN. It outclasses everything that's ever been done. You agree, <laughs> Perry Ellen Dan? Uh, I don't know. I haven't seen all the COVID interviews, but I, I often think that we do a decent job. Um, uh, no, no, no. I mean, obviously, Alina deserves the credit, but I'm saying, wow, this was a really good interview. I think uh, I think a lot of it. One has to give me a certain degree of credit. <laughs> I direct uh, direct things and keep things moving. Um, and Periel did send out the Zoom links. So we got to give her credit for. <laughs> hey, Method. <laughs> I found Alina. No, I said Alina. So that that's fantastic. All right. Any uh, that's it, I guess. Any other questions, Dan? Alina. Well, no, Al Alina. You're in you're in Massachusetts. Uh, yeah. Yes. Well, if you make it down to New York, I know Noam uh, often extends the invitation, so I'll do it this time to come to the Comedy Cellar. We'd love that. And um, do, do you go now in your in your personal COVID safety protocol? What are you doing? Are you are you going out? Are you um, wearing an NK95 or N95 <laughs> mask? Well, I I think I've been on the safer side of things. So I haven't gone to uh, large events or anything like that, uh, at least not in places where it's not ventilated. So at any time, even if it's like a Christmas party, you have to be very selective about which one you go to and you keep all the windows and doors open. So everyone is freezing to death, but <laughs> you, you're at least safe from Omicron, uh, safer from Omicron. And um, yeah, just I, I think people don't necessarily need to panic and buy all the N95s in the shop. But just practicing some common sense of, of saying, maybe this year I'm not going to like party hop. <laughs> maybe this year I'm just going to stay with my close family so I don't expose them to more variants than the Omicron virus. Uh, just, uh, yeah, not, not making people go to work in person as well, unless absolutely necessary. I think it's, that's really important. Unfortunately, I'm still seeing some companies mandate that their employees come in and sit in meeting rooms all day long with each other. And I think that's not very uh, pandemic minded. Well, okay, then I, then I do have one more question. I, I'm, I'm happy you said that because it, it triggered something that I, that I should have asked, which is I, I had felt that if the current risk profile of Omicron, let's, let's just limit this to, a, a highly vaccinated place like New York. I, I don't want to mm -hmm. comment on like Africa, which might have a totally different answer to this question. But if the current risk profile of Omicron were had been the initial risk profile of COVID when it first appeared, mm -hmm. essentially where it's mild, almost nobody's dying, you know, um, I feel like we would have done nothing as a society to react to it. We'd have just said, there's a, new, there's a new cold going around, you know, try not to get it, but we wouldn't have thought about not going to work or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So it makes me think that that much of this is PTSD. Like I'm, I don't want to get it. I don't want my wife to get it. I don't want my kids to get it. And that defies a certain amount of rationality because I, everything I know says this isn't the virus of two years ago and they are vaccinated and why shouldn't they get it? You don't freak out about a cold. You don't freak out about any number of things which are really no threat to them. So how do we put that all in a rational order? Yeah, so th there's some individual uh, liberty to think about. So some, some people might say that I am okay with getting COVID-19, so I, I will do whatever I want. Or some people might say, actually, my parents are elderly and I don't want to be the one bringing Omicron into the house to them. Even if they've been boosted, there's a chance they might still get it. And because of their, their age and, and pre-existing conditions, they might develop severe conditions. Um, and there's also people who are thinking beyond the individual and, and their families, but thinking about the healthcare workers. So I do have some friends who are nurses and doctors and they're getting slammed. So <laughs> you, it's okay for me to say that I don't need to go to all these parties this year, just in case. I don't want to be one of the people in this ICU or being an extra straw on the camel's back yeah. um, because there, there are people paying the consequences of other people's actions. Um, and so actually this book that I've published with Matt Ridley, I'm splitting my uh, proceeds. Uh, I'm, I'm donating half of it and I'm splitting the proceeds uh, three ways. 
one third is going to go to healthcare workers, nurses in particular. Half is that Matt Ridley's half? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, each 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 of us are donating half. So he he actually did that for his previous book, Rational Optimist. So I'm just following in his footsteps. So. Another third is going to wildlife conservation. So again, I, I do think that natural origin is still on the table. We still have to conserve wildlife and prevent these animals from being brought into urban centers where they can give us diseases. And the last one, I'm looking for a organization that protects whistleblowers. So this is uh -huh. very important. So a way for people to to stand up and tell us what they know. And I'm actually very optimistic about finding the origin of COVID-19. I believe it's only a matter of time. So we saw even with the anthrax leaks in, in the Soviet Union uh, in, in the 70s, it took many decades. It took basically a regime change before someone felt that it was safe enough to come out and tell us, but, but we know. Uh, and with the, also in the 70s, again, this uh, H1N1 pandemic, it was only decades later that a US scientist told us that his Chinese counterpart wrote a letter to him telling them that he, they basically know it's from a lab. So wow. it, it takes years for things to come out. And I think more needs to be done to protect whistleblowers, encourage them and, and incentivize whistleblowers. Wasn't there, a, yeah, that is incredible. Wasn't there um, a Chinese professor and COVID researcher who was um, found dead in like a very mysterious su quote unquote suicide murder? I think his name was Bing Lu or Bing Liu. Does that ring? Mm, no, I'm not. I'm not familiar with that case. I'll send you. Uh, look it up. Send, send her the meme that you saw, Periel. <laughs> I can. I can try googling it. Uh, by the way, your your previous answer. And we'll really let you go. Your previous answer about the healthcare workers. You know, it's it, it is interesting, and and you could help various agencies improve their messaging because a, a lot of the messaging we're getting doesn't really ring true because we all kind of know well, this is so mild. I have 40 friends already have gotten it. They barely lost a step. And so what am I really worried about? But if you explain to people, well, it's not about that. It's about we're all in this together and these people yeah. have been suffering in the hospitals for two years already. And now they're going to have another wave. Maybe, you know, that that's, I mean, I, I don't want to be overly optimistic about what people will actually do when they hear a message like that. At least it's an honest message. At least yeah. it's a message that I can't just say, oh, come on, that's bull. You know, no, that matters. <laughs> no. Yeah, I think it, it matters to hear from nurses and doctors. And yeah. for some reason, I have a lot of friends who are nurses and doctors. Like if I have friends who are in there, in the front line, like doing great, uh, like graveyard sh shifts, like just every night in the ICU, just like seeing all these patients, not even COVID-19 patients, but just that the combination of the COVID-19 patients and people who, who regularly need health care, need treatment like cancer or, you know, heart attack and that kind of thing, just all of that slamming them at once in a huge peak of cases, it results in a lot of burnout, there are a lot of people quitting healthcare. So I think we, we need to make sure that this pandemic doesn't obliterate our healthcare system. We, we need, we, we still need healthcare for other things than COVID. If you were the mayor of New York City right now, what, uh, what uh, would you be mandating in terms of regulations for the city? I don't think I can say that. So I'm a scientist, not a politician. <laughs> but I, I, and I think sometimes, uh, I, I think that there should be more scientists in politics. Uh, working closely with policymakers to to enact like science based uh, policy. And I've seen that uh, I've seen some efforts on on the COVID is airborne front is that we really need these aerosol scientists, people who study how viruses travel through the air, we really need them in these policy making sessions, like telling us how we should make our air cleaner, how to prevent unnecessary deaths. So it, it's so crazy to think that just putting an air filter in a room or carbon dioxide a monitor in a room can save lives <laughs> but it does right yeah yeah all right well it's been an absolute pleasure to to meet you and speak with you um i'm very happy we we, we did this um so that's it i guess uh you're, you're free to go <laughs> but let's tell everybody where they can find you oh yeah yeah on twitter oh yeah yeah um people can find me on twitter at uh a y j C H A N. And I'd be really happy if you want to read the book. So in my opinion, it's it's extremely well researched. Like 15% of the book is citations because it was co-written by me, a scientist, and Matt Riley, a science writer, a very well-known science writer. Um, and so this book, I, I think 
will stand the test of time. It was written so that no matter what is found in, this, in the future, this book really is a very good resource for anyone who wants to understand the complex issue behind where this virus came from and who are the key figures in this. So we just spent the last hour talking about just the impact of a single variant on our lives. And this is just going to keep happening again and again. And we have to do everything in our power to make sure we are not just meeting waves upon waves of new pandemics. Like we are in a new era where there's not only the pre-existing wildlife origins of pathogens, but now we have proliferating pathogen research and people need to know more about that. I'm just, I'm on your Twitter uh, page right now. Our dear friend <laughs> Judah, Judah Friedlander is following you. Oh, wow. He's a comedian and a um, somewhat of a hypochondriac. <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> You're also writing here about contact tracing. We won't get into it, but that's another interesting question. If, if America is culturally able to contact trace, it seems like it would be great if it worked, but it just never never worked out. But all right, we're going we're gonna to let you go because you've been here. And from the, wet, from the great city of Vancouver, Canada. Thank you for, even though she lives in, in Boston now. Uh, <laughs> Bye. Bye, everybody. Are we, are we, are we, are we, are we finished? Are we finished? Are we finished too, Dan Curiel? We can do a few minutes wrap up. The book is called Viral, The Search for the Origin of COVID-19. Okay. Bye, Alina. Bye, Alina. Thank you. Dr. Chan. <laughs> no, Alina works. Alina works just fine. No, I'm like normal, and I always have to remind him that uh, that he goes too far with that. Thank you, Alina. Happy Thank holidays. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. So what are we wrapping up? I think we're finished, aren't we? Until here, you got to click leave. Okay, right? bye. <laughs> she can say she wants. I don't, I don't want to keep her. That's all. <clears throat> very pleasant lady. Very, very knowledgeable. Um, I guess that's it. I didn't want to ask her what recommendation she would have for you, Noam, because I was afraid you might not like the answer. At the club? With regard to the club. Uh, I was sort of hoping you were going to ask that, but... I'm not crazy. No, I mean... <laughs> I'm not going to unilaterally shut down the club when the 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 most left wingish alarmist people are saying that people should can continue to go out. I mean, they, I mean, I you know, nobody's dying. I, I, I've been very good about this, but I don't see a reason to. I mean, people are people. Are, I presume the people who are coming to the club now are people who are vaccinated and boosted and fit and young, and they don't feel that they have to worry about this. Well, again, as long as everybody's a, yeah, I mean, I, it's, it's a swim at your own risk. Like we, like, uh, like your slogan is, is that still, is that still the uh, official uh, policy, uh, stated policy? Yes, yes, it's still the official state. I really like that expression. Um, what, do, would you go sit inside with a mask on somewhere, Noam? Uh, I, I definitely would if I didn't have one unvaccinated child. I would, yes. Even I, I, with your 47 boosters, you wouldn't do it now? No, because the, I, the, well, I mean, these are tough questions because you have to say, well, how important is it? How, like, what was at stake? But like, just in general right now? Yeah, just in general right now. It's no, not I, I'm like staying home and, and I'd like to take the next few weeks to let things blow over. I'm going to go to work uh, and, and check on things periodically or a few times a week, you know, I'll put my N100 mask on and go to work. I don't plan to stay and socialize or eat indoors with my mask off. But uh, if I, I, I wouldn't go see a comedy show now and take my mask off and have drinks, I, why would I do that? No, 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 but you would go, you're gonna go inside with a mask on. With an N100 mask on, yes. I will go inside with an N100 mask on, yeah. I think that's safe to do. It's I do safe. too, I'm just curious. Dan, what are you going to do when you're allowed back into the world? I'm going to I'm going to try to make make some money and take those spots from all those people that are that are sick. <laughs> Once he knows he's immune to Omicron, he's going to hit the strip clubs and the escort services. I know Dan. <laughs> is Mark Norman well? Because I don't know how, how the hell is the guy like that? <laughs> connected you to that. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I saw him name on a schedule. I'm like, how the fuck is this guy not got Omicron <laughs> with his uh, lifestyle? A lot of people have it, a lot. And, and, and there's always a certain number of people who are not telling us, so. Well, it's, it's, it's hard to hide it if you, you know, I mean, you know, um, but anyway. Uh, it's not hard to hide it. 
well, it's hard to hide it. If I showed up at the comedy cell, you'd know something was wrong. I'm just yeah. not quite as sharp and, you know. <laughs> I don't think we noticed then, but. <laughs> um, so a podcast at ComedySally.com. This episode was obviously a lot different than our last episode. We're all over the place, folks. So which, which do you prefer? Do you prefer this very, very uh, science-based episode or the last episode where we talked about writing new jokes? Let us know. Or do you like... Do you like when we alternate between the two? Let us know. Podcast at ComedyCellar.com. Um, Perry L's books, uh, The Only Bush I Trust is My Own, and On My Knees, available on Amazon. My book, Iris Spiro Before COVID, also available on Amazon. Comedy Cellar has shows seven nights a week. You don't have to buy a drink. You can keep your mask on the whole time. Don't encourage it, Dan. Just tell me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that's your personal risk. Uh, profile will dictate it. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Good night.